Alexa. Thank you. It's good to be with you this morning. And uh, I am grateful for the Henry Center uh, uh, for its goodness to me over the last several years. And uh, being one of the batch of uh, research fellows a couple of years ago was a terrific experience. I consider it the high point of my academic life, as a matter of fact. I am uh, just deeply, deeply thankful for the Henry Center and for the personnel there. Now, the uh, notion of the fall of Adam and Eve, our first parents, has played an important role in Christian theology and, to a lesser extent, in Jewish theology as well, with perhaps the proviso that Christians have made more, much more of the impact of the disobedience upon humankind in general. But in both strands, it's taken for granted that Genesis 3 recounts an actual event which had a profound impact on all subsequent human life. Christian theologians use the fall to explain the need for sacrifice and redemption, uh, and thus the purpose of Christ's incarnation. They also use it to account for the problem of evil, and uh, uh, some extend that include, to include all manner of natural evil, such as earthquakes and mosquitoes. Uh, however, many in uh, biblical studies would have us believe that the fall, as conventionally understood, is of no real consequence in the Hebrew Bible. Uh, now, these are dangerous waters to swim in, and probably the biggest fish is Klaus Westermann. I'll cite him, and I'll leave the uh, lesser fish, the remoras, to another time. Well, here's what uh, Westermann wrote about uh, the story in Genesis 3. First of all, it must be stated that in the Old Testament, the text did not have an all-embracing meaning. It is nowhere cited or presumed in the Old Testament. Its significance is limited to primeval events. Well, there are several difficulties with this uh, claim. Uh, let me explain. Uh, no, there's too much. Let me simply sum up. The, uh, the first difficulty is what constitutes a citation or presumption. And a related difficulty is, does an allusion to any part of Genesis 1 to 11 count as one of these echoes? And there's still more. Has this perceived rarity of allusion become part of a circular argument? That is, once we think that there are no illusions, do we then dismiss uh, possible illusions because we know ahead of time that such an illusion is unlikely since it's so rare? And finally, does not the presence or absence of illusions depend on the communicative intentions of the biblical writers and their perceptions of the needs of their audiences? That is to say, a later writer may or may not find an echo of this passage useful to what he's trying to do in the later text which means that the perceived rarity of citation hardly implies that this story has no bearing on the rest of the Hebrew Bible. Now, the final form of Genesis 1 through 11 is the only form that we actually have, and in that light, I find myself far more in line with the opinion of uh, Walter Vogels, a Canadian uh, scholar, who said this, one can never stress enough the importance of the first 11 chapters of Genesis in the Bible as a whole. We often think of the Bible as being the history of Israel, but if this were the case, the Bible then would be the only national history which starts with creation. The first 11 chapters of Genesis do not speak of Israel, but of humanity, of all of us, to whatever race or tribe we may belong. The readers are invited to start the reading of the Bible not with the history of Israel, nor, nor even with Jesus, but with these profound reflections about humankind. The first pages of any book are always important because they set the tone. Uh, and I, I would uh, always urge you to be careful when people say the Bible clearly says X. Uh, rather, the proper way to say it is here's how I read the Bible and why you should read it that way as well. Uh, I think that's the responsible way of conducting ourselves. And my reading of the Hebrew Bible fits well with the conventional uh, reading of the fall story, and I find that this also suits the best studies in linguistics and rhetoric. So yes, it is how I read it, and I hope you'll find it persuasive, and at the same time, I hope not to be denominational or worse, idiosyncratic. Uh, indeed, I would argue that the Apostle Paul, if, as Christians have generally understood him, has supplied what we may call a Sternbergian reading in honor of Mayor Sternberg, and I'll get to that in a moment. So I'll take up four points, and I'll, uh, I will do a lot of summing up as we go along. Uh, first, I want to show why we should read the Hebrew Bible as presenting the fall as a reality. 
Secondly, I would want to consider some of the consequences for humankind and for the non-human creation. Third, I want to show its importance in the rest of the Hebrew Bible uh, beyond Genesis 1 through 11. And then finally, I'll take up the matter of the enduring relevance of the fall. So let's begin. The fall is a reality. And uh, let's start with terminology. Uh, and uh, we'll just make a frank acknowledgement here. The Bible nowhere calls the events of Genesis 3 a fall. Uh, an early designation by that name comes from Greek Christians using cognates of the verb pipto. Uh, uh, neither does the Hebrew Bible spell out a doctrine of the fall and its consequences. We may not conclude from that, however, that the notion itself is an imposition upon Genesis. If we properly employ the tools from literary and rhetorical theory, we'll see that that designation is, in fact, quite fitting. So uh, let's move on then to talk about the reality. And one of the most important contributions uh, of Mayer Sternberg to biblical studies is his point that biblical narrators rely far more on showing than on telling. Showing, displaying the heart by action and by speech, and telling is the narrator telling, telling us explicitly what kind of person the narrator is. <clears throat> and I'll add to this category uh, of, of um, uh, Sternberg, the category of epideictic uh, rhetoric, a, a topic that modern rhetoricians have rightly taken into helpful advances over Aristotle's narrowly circumscribed discussion of it. Gordon Wenham's book, Stor Storia's Torah, actually uh, uh, invites readers to approach the Old Testament narratives epideictically, although he doesn't use that terminology. And I'll, I'll come back to that in a few minutes. Uh, in this, as we read a narrative, we actually evaluate the characters, and the act of assigning praise and blame develops and strengthens a community's values. Well, James Barr spoke for many literalists when he observed that none of the usual Hebrew words for sin and transgression appear in Genesis 3 and that we should not see this, therefore, as describing the first sin. But you see, Barr has relied on telling entirely, with no attention at all to showing. If we read the account with the help of Sternberg, we don't need to be told. We see it happening. Why, the serpent speaks intolerable evil. He's outright calling God a liar. And the woman listens to him and eats what the Lord commanded them not to eat. In a word, she disobeys or transgresses. In light of this, the Lord's judgments are justice tinged with mercy. And there are enduring consequences as well, not only for Adam and Eve, but also for their descendants. They're booted out of the garden with no way to return, except by way of the sacrificial ordinances of the tabernacle. And we have a rapid decline into horrible evils such as murder and bigamy and vengeance, leading up to the earth being filled with violence instead of being filled with the offspring of Adam and Eve living in communities that nourish the imitation of God. Lamech speaks of the ground the Lord has cursed and describes his son Noah as the relief from the painful toil uh, in Genesis 5.29, echoing the curses in Genesis 3. That is to say, subsequent generations experience the chastisements of the Lord that the Lord had de declared upon Adam and Eve in Genesis 3.16-19. The divine assessment at both the beginning and the end of the flood story in Genesis 6 and 8 is that every intention of the thoughts of the human heart is only evil continually. And that contrasts starkly with the very good of the first declaration in Genesis 1 and verse 31. Well, this demands an explanation and the conventional idea that Adam and Eve disobeyed and by their disobedience made themselves and their offspring sinners cannot be beat. Well, I want to summarize uh, my own reading of how this works on human nature. I've expounded it elsewhere in an, in an essay online in Sapientia. Um, <clears throat> and uh, I'm drawing on uh, some of the Greek fathers and some of the modern Semiticists to uh, argue this, and I'll uh, be brief about it. Uh, I understand that God made humankind good, but not yet mature, and by their obedience, they were too mature, and thus to be confirmed in goodness. The Greek fathers tend to uh, connect this confirmation with immortality so that the result of the fall for humankind is both the lost chance for immortality and the subjection to moral and physical corruption. I don't have time to discuss the, uh, the uh, divine sentence, in the day you eat of it, you will surely die. And so I'll simply declare that 
uh, what is called spiritual death or perhaps better relational death or alienation is surely the right inference from the text uh, if, if you follow the Sternbergian principles. Well, in order to, to appreciate uh, how Genesis 3 was intended to influence its audiences, we should also see the epideictic element in it. That is to say, we're invited to assess the characters and to assign praise and blame. Now, we're Israelite readers. We're already familiar with the notion of dark forces that oppose the Creator's purpose, even before we read these passages in Genesis. And we recognize from the serpent's speech the very embodiment of these forces. Indeed, Israelites knew, as well as any herpetologist does, that snakes don't talk uh, and that they don't eat dust either. And in the ancient Near East, a serpent could function as a picture of forces that thwart human well-being. So our revulsion at the serpent's words would combine with our pre-existing knowledge, which leads to an identification of the power that speaks through this serpent, whom later writers would call Satan. And if we're a properly cooperative audience, we deeply dislike him and all his works. And not only the ancient ones, but the ones that we might encounter, uh, such as the deceptions of idolatry. And we see Eve listening to this, and we want to shout, hey, don't pay attention to him. Pay him no mind, whatever. Send him away. No, don't even think about that tree. Why did you do that? And we're horrified by the very thought of our own susceptibility to deception and disobedience. That is to say that the text has a purpose for the sake of the people of Israel. In all of this, we're invited as well to admire the Lord, who never loses his cool in all of this. He never lashes out. He remains the, uh, the sole authority in heaven and on earth, who still pursues his human creatures with love and redemption, even after all of that. Who could not return such love with devotion and loyalty? So then the consequences of the fall, excuse me a second. <clears throat> Let's consider the consequences of the fall first for humankind. Well, the consequences extend to all subsequent generations of humans after this fall. Now, one term for these consequences is original sin. But not everybody means the same thing by that term, which means that we're going to have the puzzled gaze of Inigo Montoya. You keep using that word, I do not think it means what you think it means. So uh, in order to be a Catholic rather than sectarian, I'll simply mean that by the disobedience of our originals, Adam and Eve, all humankind were made sinners, using the terminology of Romans 5 and verse 19. Various strands of Catholic Christianity have explained this differently. The Greek-speaking fathers tended to emphasize the lost chance for immortality and humankind's subjection to moral and physical corruption, as I mentioned before. Western Christians have commonly added the aspect of guilt, which the Eastern writers generally reject. Now, the differences between them are real. I don't know that all of these writers uh, all use the same definition of guilt, St. Inigo coming back again. Uh, and when the very early fathers don't talk about guilt, that's not the same as denying it. So uh, I'm not uh, entirely certain that all the disagreements are as pronounced as the later ones came to be. On the other hand, guilt as an identifiable legal category, I'm not convinced that that plays a large part in the relations between God and man in the Hebrew Bible. Now, mind you, that doesn't make it invalid, but it should remind us that it's a model, and we use it as a model uh, and, and, uh, and uh, observe its limitations as well. A further uh, uh, result follows from identifying the serpent as the mouthpiece of a dark power. Humans are subject to demonic torment and oppression, and that's exemplified by the sons of God in Genesis 6 under the common interpretation of them as demonic powers, which I uh, certainly agree with. Well, the whole arrangement makes sense if we see Adam and Eve as acting on behalf of their descendants. We might speak of a covenant, as Irenaeus did, but that is controversial, though it need not be, but I'm not going to stand on the term. We can call it representation, if we like, so, so long as we don't reduce that to a legal fiction. Rather, all of humankind is in a relationship of solidarity with Adam, with Adam and Eve, which may involve what we call legal aspects, but also involves what we can call participatory aspects, echoes of some of the discussions about uh, Pauline theology 
uh, in there. And so in the second diagram, I've tried to move the representative into clearly a part of the people whom he represents. As an aside, I'll point out that the solidarity understanding fits well with conventional notions of the fall taking place at the headwaters of humankind rather than somewhere downstream, which would be a kind of infection model. I, I was uh, fascinated, uh, Doug, that you used that, that terminology yesterday, um, and uh, I suppose out of the mouths of two witnesses, there you go. Um, <clears throat> So I would also say that this taken together with the unique role of humankind in God's creation is a far more important concern of the narrative than the materials and processes that God might have used in forming the first humans or even than the size of the initial population of human beings. Now the audience of Genesis were primarily uh, farmers and herdsmen. Their daily lives were filled with uh, painful toil, the sweat of their brows, the pains and dangers of childbirth, conflicts with family members and neighbors, and they surely wished that life were not like this. Indeed, it was not intended to be like this. Their wish corresponds to a reality. The present reality is summed up quite effectively by the dread pirate Roberts. Life is pain, Highness. Anyone who says differently is selling something. But it wasn't supposed to be that way in the beginning which opens up the door of hope that it will not always remain that way, a hope that the prophets especially foster. So uh, let's consider then the uh, consequences for the rest of creation. The uh, curses of Genesis 3, 16 to 19, fall not just on human life, but on the ground. Some have supposed that this means that the ground itself doesn't work the way that it was made to do, that thorns and thistles did not previously exist. Some imagine as well that there was no animal death prior to these curses, and that eating meat is a distortion of the originally good creation. In support of this, they often turn uh, to Isaiah 6, uh, sorry, Isaiah 11, verses 6 through 9, uh, which I'll come to, as if it foretells a return to vegetarian existence for the predator predatory animals. And then Romans 8, 18 to 22, treating it as a commentary on the fallenness of creation. But I think a literary and rhetorical reading of Genesis 3 make a conclusion like that very unlikely. First, take the matter of the serpent. Doesn't he look friendly there? Um, and as, as a one-time herpetologist, I can tell you that's a friendly look. Um, uh, in uh, Genesis 3, verses 14 and 15, we must understand that this is no ordinary snake. And hence, uh, uh, the literal reading of a transformation of its low mode of locomotion, on your belly you shall go, and its diet, dust you shall eat, cannot be taken as cooperation with the text. I, I've argued elsewhere that a good reader who attends to the literary technique of showing over telling will recognize, first of all, animals do not speak without interference, like Balaam's donkey. Uh, and then secondly, the serpent speaks unbearable evil and that such a reader will conclude that the serpent acts as a tool of an evil power, uh, as, as I've said earlier. The expressions, go on the belly and eat dust, convey an image of defeat and humiliation. The serpent will not have the final victory. And hence, the curse on the serpent does not concern a change in the workings of the creation. Uh, the woman, however, in uh, verse 16, will experience multiplied pain in childbearing. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, the blessing of childbearing in which people were to multiply from Genesis 1 has become the arena of pain and danger with multiplied anguish. I take this to imply that we're to imagine an unfallen Eve delivering children without uh, such multiplied pains, but we must acknowledge that the text doesn't set out to say what bodily changes are in view here. Uh, further, the second part of the verse foretells enduring conflict between husband and wife, which only serious self-discipline can overcome. Now, the curse on the ground appears in the third sentence, that pronounced on the man, in verses 17 through 19. Specifically, cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Now, bodily death for humans is one of the things in view, but I don't think that this must mean that humans were created immortal. Interpreters differ. My take 
as I've said before, is that the created condition was intended to be temporary. And thus how we picture it scientifically is not actually important. I think the humans by their obedience were to become confirmed in goodness, as I said before. Well, ought we to think that the thorns and thistles did not exist before, that they were created as a punishment for human sin? Well, this seems odd for a number of reasons. First, have, as many have, have observed, God has entered his Sabbath, uh, resting from his work of creation. That's an observation as old as Aristobulus in the second century BC. Uh, further, any farmer knows that thorns and thistles are the proper food for some animals, such as Eeyore. Uh, uh, they just don't suit human need. The, the story where, uh, where Tigger comes to the forest is actually a discussion of what is the proper food for each of these particular animals. Uh, very uh, uh, deep, uh, yeah, uh, from St. <laughs> Pooh and St. <Saint> Eeyore. <clears throat> anyway, um, the, uh, the point then is that the land under God's direction we, will yield thorns and thistles uh, when the humans working it were looking for wheat or barley. Uh, and so the thorns and the thistles become a recurring image of land that is unfruitful for human purposes uh, th in the prophets and also in the New Testament. Well, next consider the expression, cursed is the ground. Uh, we note first that it refers to the ground, the place that people work and hope for crops and not to the whole of the creation. But what does this imply about changes to the way that the ground works? Well, the specific expression occurs only in Genesis 4.11 and 5.29, both of which are looking back to 3.17, uh, and nowhere else. The verb, however, cursed, uh, appears again, and, and the verb and the related noun appears again in Deuteronomy 28, 17 and 18. Cursed shall be your basket and your kneading bowl. Cursed shall be the fruit of your womb and the fruit of your ground, the increase of your herds and the young of your flock. And the related noun, uh, the, uh, the noun curse, is the Lord will send on you curses, confusion and frustration and all that you undertake to do until you are destroyed and perish quickly on account of the evil of your deeds because you have forsaken me. Now in Deuteronomy 28, uh, you have in verses 38 to 46 the outworking of this, and nowhere does any of this material imply that somehow human sin has distorted the workings of the natural elements. Rather, agriculture is the arena in which God brings his chastisement upon human beings. Well, this will make good sense if we put it in context with the geography. God formed the man in some dry land in Genesis 2, 5 through 7, and transplanted him to the garden to work it and keep it in Genesis 2.15. And he commissioned him and his wife to multiply and have dominion. When the man sinned, God banished him from the garden to work the ground from which he was taken, a place, uh, banished him uh, to, to the ground from which he was taken, a place that naturally produces thorns and thistles. The account never suggests that the ground did not produce thorns and thistles prior to this point. It instead indicates that, the wor that working the ground is to be the arena of pain. And this is due not to a change in the properties of the ground, but to the change in humanity and to God's providential purposes of chastisement. There's uh, no indication that uh, human dominion over the creation has been rescinded, but there's every indication that humans will exercise it badly, uh, exploiting and damaging the creation and using it to exploit and damage other people. In other words, the construct offered by Al Walters works well for this picture. He proposes two components which he calls structure and direction. In this uh, construct, structure refers to the order of creation, to the constant creational constitution of anything which makes it the thing or entity that it is. Uh, in the terms that I have used, uh, this corresponds to the workings of the created things. In Walters' discussion, uh, direction by contrast designates the order of sin and redemption, the distortion or perversion of creation through the fall on the one hand and the redemption and restoration of creation in Christ on the other. I think we can adjust the idea to be more general where direction refers to the way in which the creation is managed and ruled by humankind, either in line with God's creational institution before the fall or in opposition to it after the fall. That is, we can combine Walter's basic idea with the solidarity concept where creation is in humankind. If we go back to that picture, uh, the, the biblical terminology of being in someone uh, is, 
as you see in the circle there where, where uh, humankind are, they have a representative, humankind are in that representative. Uh, that's, I, I think, the origin of the um, Pauline in Christ terminology as well, some other time for that. As Walters notes, uh, God does not allow man's disobedience to turn his creation into utter chaos. The structure of all the creational givens persists despite their directional perversion. And hence, if we wish to say that the creation is fallen, we should say that it is fallen in man. Perhaps this will help us to envision the situation. Uh, in the sacred Pooh stories, everything is right when Christopher Robin is present. Everyone trusts his wisdom and his goodness. But if he were taken away, and I'm not even, not even going to consider his turning evil, all the animals, though their proper natures are not changed, would not be guided. The connection between humankind and the rest of the world is even more intimate than that. Well, further, the, uh, uh, yeah, we can uh, doctor the uh, poo stories even more. Uh, further, the uh, Hebrew Bible does not present animal death as a consequence of the fall. Now, I agree with Aquinas that nothing in Genesis suggests that no animals were carnivorous before the fall. The divine sentence does not involve a change in their proper natures. Uh, further, neither does Genesis indicate that humans ate no meat before the flood, which is how some people read the passage in Genesis 9, verses 2 and 3. Any attentive Israelite would recognize that Abel's offering, the one that God regarded, uh, was a kind of a peace offering from which the worshipers ate the flesh of the sacrificial animals. Uh, I suppose one could argue that the Pentateuch is incoherent, but I think that creates more problems than it solves, and I'm not going to go there. Uh, indeed, Psalm 104, which uh, celebrates the proper functioning of the creation, includes an appreciation for the large carnivores. In verse 21, the young lions roar for their prey, seeking their food from God. That prey and that food consist primarily of the larger herbivores. The psalm concludes uh, the section that includes this verse with verse 24, O Lord, how manifold are your works. In wisdom you've made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. The predatory lions, therefore, are not an evil unless they prey on the flock. But sinful human beings are, in fact, an evil. As the psalm finishes with the only mention of evil, at the very end, let sinners be consumed from the earth and let the wicked be no more. Bless the Lord, O my soul, praise the Lord. Well, some will appeal to the passage in Isaiah 11, verses 6 through 8, in support of an originally vegetarian animal world to which God will return us either in the millennium or in the eternal state. Now, I'm not here entering into any discussion of eschatological issues <laughs> nor of theological systems. I'll simply observe that Isaiah 11 offers no support to a literal notion of animal diet. Uh, I take the relevant passage to be uh, the entirety of Isaiah 11, verses 1 to 10, since the root and the name Jesse in verse 10 echo verse 1, and they provide, therefore, an envelope. I don't see any reason to doubt that this passage uh, describes the reign of the Messiah, the royal heir of David. Uh, and I'd argue here that this activity takes place in our present era and that the predatory animals are a common figure in the prophets for predatory empires. Uh, now, the, this person will judge and decide disputes in Isaiah 11, verses 3 and 4, using the same words that appear in Isaiah 2 and verse 4, where the Lord will judge and decide disputes. And the prophet's latter days refer to the days of the Messiah, as many Jewish interpreters will recognize. And as I judge anyway, this lies behind the New Testament use of the Greek equivalents, the last days, and so on. And, and further, the image of imperial powers, as I said, or more generally strong oppressors as predatory animals is quite well attested in the Old Testament. I have a long list here, and there is just one sample. A lion from the forest shall strike them down. A wolf from the desert shall devastate them. A leopard is uh, watching their cities. Notice the lion, the wolf, and the leopard, uh, which also appear in Isaiah 11. And this is describing the impending doom at the hands of the Babylonian Empire. Indeed, a poem that's roughly contempt, and you can find this usage, by the way, including in the New Testament and in the early uh, Christian fathers as well. A poem roughly contemporary with Isaiah, uh, Homer's Iliad, 
whether it was written by Homer or a poet of the same name, is uh, a, a matter for other discussion. But uh, you have uh, Achilles describing himself in words very close to the Septuagint of our passage in Isaiah 11. Uh, in book 22, Hector and Achilles are finally squaring off, and Hector's proposed a covenant that the victor will hand the body of the vanquished over to the family for proper funeral rites. And Achilles refuses. He says, Hector, talk not to me, thou madman of covenants. As between lions and men, there are no oaths of faith, nor do wolves and lambs have hearts of concord, but are evil-minded continually one against the other. That is to say, in a rhetorically high context, you expect these predatory animals to be used as images of human behavior rather than a concern with what you could call natural history as such. Uh, and and uh, so when we come to these verses, 6 through 8 of Isaiah 11, uh, the wolf shall dwell with the lamb and the leopard shall lie down with the young goat and the calf and the lion and the fattened calf together and a little child shall eat them, shall lead them, yeah, eat them. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, Uh, yeah, that, that would be a, a more interesting image, I suppose. But uh, the cow and the bear shall graze, and the young shall, uh, their young shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. As C.S. Lewis commented, if you told a lion that he was going to eat straw like an ox, he would think that was hell rather than heaven, right? So you, already, you uh, are already clued into the use of imagery. The nursing child shall play over the hole of the cobra, and the weaned child shall put his hand on the adder's den. They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Well, this is highly relevant to the context of Isaiah's prophecy in which Judah is threatened by other powers, and especially by Assyria. Um, and <clears throat> other powers in addition, present and future, are also mentioned. In the uh, parallel passage in Isaiah 2, verses 1 to 5, we're led to expect that under the Lord's benevolent rule, the Gentiles will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore, for which Isaiah 11, 6 through 9, provides us a good picture. Uh, and so Isaiah's prophecy leaves us free then to admire the uh, predatory skills of the lions and the tigers and the bears, including uh, Hobbes. Since I'm a Calvinist, I suppose I can include some of that. <laughs> so uh, I would also uh, suggest that this corresponds to how the apostles, and especially Paul, read, uh, read the text. Um, and I'll just simply mention that the apostle Paul uh, cites this passage in Isaiah without going into detail, because I'm looking at that clock there, and I don't wish to incur anyone's wrath this morning. Um, he cites Isaiah 11 and verse 10 as the capstone of his argument for uh, the inclusion of Jews and Gentiles in the same church and also as part of the motivation for his own mission to the ends of the earth. So finally for this section here, and I'm just about to wrap up, uh, so uh, keep your seat. Um, uh, it needs to be said that Romans 8, 19 to uh, 23 shows no signs of reflecting on the curses in Genesis 3. The flood story, I would argue, is a far more likely backlog. Uh, the creation waits with eager longing, Paul says, for the revealing of the sons of God, for the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope, that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now, and so forth. My point here is that the, uh, the terminology bondage to corruption, uh, uh, I think, uh, by the accepted criteria for identifying echoes of the Old Testament in the New Testament, uh, leads me to uh, believe that the flood story, the uh, corruption described in the flood story, is far more likely to be the background. Uh, the Greek noun thora and uh, the uh, cognate verb uh, including in, it, in its compound form in the Septuagint of the flood story, as you can see on the screen. Humans have corrupted their way and thus have corrupted the earth by filling it with human unrighteousness. In the Septuagint, in the Hebrew, it's uh, with violence. Uh, hence, the Lord's judgment upon humankind would be his corrupting or destroying them along with the earth. 
In other words, the earth suffers because it is the arena both of human evil and of divine judgment. The personified creation here yearns for the final consummation, the result of which will be our confirmation in the wisdom, benevolence, and holiness by which we will rule the renewed heavens and earth. And this explains why the prophets would uh, portray the land as mourning. Uh, that's mourning with a U. The land mourns because it suffers God's judgment. I'm going to skip over that section here and just uh, briefly um, Yee, uh, its importance in the rest of the Hebrew Bible. It is presupposed throughout, uh, is, I'm going, as I say, I'm going to skip, uh, skip to the end, uh, as uh, Prince Humperdinck says. Uh, it is not without uh, importance, James Barr says, that the term sin, as we already looked at that, within the Hebrew Bible itself, the story of Adam and Eve, nowhere is cited as the explanation for sin and evil in the world. Again, he's looking for telling rather than showing. Um, and uh, it seems to me that that is a very, very inadequate strategy for reading the Hebrew Bible. Uh, this sentiment runs clean contrary to the narrative logic of the early chapters of Genesis. It's also mistaken as to fact, as the flood story uh, shows. I think it's fair to say that the fall is traditionally understood is presupposed in ever so many ways in the Hebrew Bible. Just in the very call of Abraham to be the vehicle by which light comes to the Gentiles, presupposes both that the Gentiles share a common humanity with Israel and that these Gentiles are estranged from God. The Levitical system treats sin as a defiling intruder that incurs God's displeasure that requires atonement, redemption, and cleansing. And so uh, this uh, a theme verse, I guess, for the conference that God made men uh, upright, but they have sought out many schemes, uh, is, I think, correctly interpreted by the Israeli commentator Yehuda Kiel uh, as a description of the fall of humankind. So uh, s speeding ahead, our present condition then is explained by the fact that we are members of a spoiled species, as St. Louis put it. And uh, another way uh, in which it's presupposed is in the way in which uh, Palestine is regularly portrayed as Eden redivivus. Uh, that is to say, um, the uh, the way that Genesis describes the Garden of Eden uh, is uh, directed to the Israelites uh, who are already familiar with the tabernacle and later with the temple, and they'll recognize the garden as a kind of sanctuary, and they will also uh, recognize that the garden is the way in which the, la the promised land is described. Uh, the idea is that the flourishing of the land is to be emblematic of the spiritual flourishing of the people within it, which is why, of course, the land is the arena in which they are chastised. Um, then, uh, because of what I take to be the literary style of Genesis 1 through 11, I'm sure that there's plenty of symbolism and pictorial description in these chapters, so I'm not overly concerned with exactly what these primeval events would have looked like to a camcorder. Uh, in general, I expect the intentions of the biblical writers when describing the pre-fall world is in order to shape the audience's stance toward Palestine in its special role. But I would stress as well that this pictorial quality hardly diminishes the possibility that there's an actual event or complex of events that the account refers to. <clears throat> and I think the assumed eventitude of the disobedience of humankind at its headwaters for the Hebrew Bible comes through fairly straightforwardly, just as traditional Jews and Christians have generally thought. I do need to bring this to a close. I uh, wanted to uh, share with you some events from the uh, the a conversation in the, the Pacific. I can save that for another time. I, I would say that uh, uh, the, um, the, the various things that we encounter, earthquakes, tsunamis, hurricanes, uh, in, in this conversation, uh, Bob Leckie is proposing mosquitoes and the Japanese as uh, uh, parts of the problem of evil. Uh, uh, and that's because it was during a war, okay? So, um, and it's, I don't think it's intended to be an ethnic thing. Uh, but uh, Sledge is a, a d describes the issue of the Japanese in terms of the misuse of the human we uh, will. The mosquitoes, he said, would be a harder problem. Um, but uh, we're tempted to trace all of these things back to the first fall of our first parents. I do not believe that such a move is helpful or true to the Bible. Uh, we must be careful to speak of evils in a way that the biblical authors would agree with. And often what we mean by evil is that we don't like something and we can't see a good use for it. Uh, it seems to me that animal death is not a part of an evil. And likewise, it seems to me that the, uh, 
movement of plate tectonics and so forth uh, should not be viewed as an evil. But we do nevertheless suffer as human beings, first of all, because we do not have the sympathetic feel for the natural world necessary to govern it to uniformly benign purposes. We don't govern ourselves by uniformly benign purposes, and we've lost our closeness to God by which we can perceive his hand in every natural event. Um, and uh, just to finish and skip right ahead, the, bi the biblical picture then is that God, in making the world, imparted some of his own goodness to it. He made our first parents good, but they disobeyed and made us, their children, sinners. Nevertheless, God rules the world in goodness and shows his saving goodness to fallen human beings. Is God's world still good after the fall of our first parents? Yes, in regard to its structures, and not yet in regard to its direction. Thank you.